Let me take this opportunity to say that, that uh, I appreciate you watching us online or visiting us in service. It's also all, always a privilege. I had somebody to stop by this Wednesday night and say to me that they'd been watching us online and how that the Word of God had touched their hearts and that humbled me. And I pray that I can always preach the truth in love and love and, but also preach with conviction. So I, I appreciate you watching us. Uh, if you feel a desire and ever feel uh, like the Lord's speaking to you to give to our local church ministries, I encourage you to do that. You can do that by going to easytithe.com and finding Prospect Church of God there. And uh, you can do that. And I believe there's a QR code there that you can use there that take you directly into our, our giving website. We appreciate that. We are a small church with a big heart. And trying to do ministry is tough in the day we live. So I would encourage you to do that if at all possible. And uh, I'm not asking you to take tithe from your local church. Your tithe belongs to your local church, not ours. Uh, but maybe there's an offering that you would feel like giving to our church. And I would I'd really appreciate that. God bless you. Well, I guess you already know what scripture to go to this morning. The last several weeks, we have been looking at a series of messages that the Lord laid upon my heart called The Road to Blasphemy. That if there is a sin that can never be forgiven, that a man or a woman or a teenager could do that would keep them from heaven and not be forgiven, we should know what that is. We should, we should really want to know what that is. Because if the scripture says it can happen, it can happen. Amen. If the scripture says that you can blaspheme the Holy Spirit and not be forgiven, that's exactly what it means. So we've been looking up for the last several weeks what leads up to blaspheming the Holy Ghost. And we have probably two or three more weeks in this. Uh, we talked about resisting the Holy Spirit, how people resist Him. We, we talked about how that um, even our conversation and everything we do in life that's against the, the, the Word of God, we, 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 we're leading up to that. This morning, I want you to stand with me and I want you to turn to two scriptures, if you would. One is found in Matthew chapter 12 and verses 31 and 32. Let me... So it's good to see all of you here today. Michael, it's good to see him here this morning. He was showing me where he had that tractor wreck and how close he was to uh, being crushed by that tractor. But he's standing in the house of God this morning. And I believe it's Bill, right? Good to have Bill this morning. Good to have him in service. And and, and uh, all of you, I, um, I love you. I want you to know that. He, uh, he buys my dinner at farmhouse sometimes, amen, and that young lady with him, God bless you, good to see everybody. But uh, I want you to turn to Matthew chapter 12 and then also over in 2 Peter chapter 1 and verse 16. The Bible says, Wherefore I say unto you, all manner of sin and blasphemy shall be forgiven unto men, but the blasphemy against the Holy Ghost shall not be forgiven unto men. Whosoever speaketh the word against the Son of Man, it shall be forgiven him. But whosoever speaketh against the Holy Ghost, it shall not be forgiven him, neither in this world, or neither in the world to come. Amen. And over in Second Peter chapter 1 and verse 16, For we have not followed cunningly devised fables, when we made known unto you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but were eyewitnesses of his majesty. For he received from God the Father honor and glory. When there came such a voice to him from the excellent glory, this is my beloved Son in whom I'm well pleased. And this voice, does anybody know who that voice was? And this voice which came from heaven we heard when we were with him in the holy mount. 
We have also a most sure word of prophecy where until you dwell, do well, that you take heed as into a light that shineth in a dark place until the day dawn. And the day star arise in your hearts, knowing this first, that no prophecy of the scripture is of any private interpretation, for the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. Amen. Father in heaven, please help me today. I've got to have your help. I've, I've done my, I really believe I've done my part to hear and to pray and to study and to fast. And God, I pray today that you would speak your word to the people of God and that we'd leave here today with such an expectancy that this could be the day that the Lord comes. That this could be the very day that you make your appearing and you catch away the saints of God. And God, I praise you for that. If there's anybody here today that's not ready for the rapture, I pray today, God, that they'd come to the altar and pray and make their life ready. And I'll give you praise and I'll give you glory in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. As I began to listen to the Lord concerning this message today, I began to almost question in my heart the direction that the Lord was leading me. He said to me that we reject the Holy Spirit when we fail to look for his return or the rapture of the church. And I thought, now Lord, how could that be? I thought to myself, how is not looking or anticipating the rapture, rejecting the Holy Spirit. Then he reminded me that it was the Holy Ghost who breathed upon men the word of God. Every word they penned, Sister Shirley, came from the Holy Spirit that directed them and told them what to write. Now what we have called the Bible. So he reminded me of that. Uh, for the prophecy came not of old time by the will of men, but by holy men that God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. So the Holy Spirit revealed to the prophets, prophets the messages of the scripture. The writers of the Bible wrote not according to their own whims and their own wills but only as they were moved or controlled by the Holy Ghost. And the Bible, or is anybody glad today that the Bible is God's own book? Amen. And it's written by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. So when we reject the Word of God, we reject the Holy Spirit. Did you hear what I said? When we reject anything in the Word of God, we reject the Holy Spirit. And so today, the Lord has laid upon my heart to talk to you about that we reject the Holy Spirit when we fail to watch that today could be the day that the Lord comes. You see, I truly believe there are very few people who are really looking for Jesus to come. There's not many people that are really looking for the return of Christ. I believe it for this reason. If people believe the Lord can come today, they would live like they believe the Lord could come today. Somebody help me a minute. If we really believe the Lord can come today, I really believe we'd live with the Isaacs like we believed the Lord could come today. If we believe that Jesus is coming again, I'm telling you, we're going to be different in who we are and what we do. There is no greater incentive to holy living than the truth that at any moment he could return back to this earth. Amen. Nothing should make you live any holier than to believe that the Lord can come today. Oh, my Lord, help me. So I believe that if we really believe the Lord could come today, at any moment there's some certain incentives that we're going to have in our heart. First of all, if we really believe he's coming, we're really going to be watching. 
in Matthew chapter 25 and verse 13, Watch therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour wherein the Son of Man cometh. Hallelujah. I, 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 I love this old song. It says, I'm watching for the coming of the glad millennial day when our blessed Lord shall come and catch his waiting bride away. Oh, my heart is filled with rapture as I labor, watch, and pray for our Lord is coming back to earth again. Hallelujah. Yes, our Lord is coming back to earth again. Yes, our Lord is coming back to earth again. Satan will be bound a thousand years and will have no tempter then for our Lord is coming back to earth again. See, nobody knows the day or the hour where the Lord's coming back. Matthew 24 and 42, Watch therefore, for you know not the hour your Lord cometh, but know this, that if the good men of the house had known what watch the thief would come, he would have watched, and it would not suffer the house to be broken into. Therefore be ye also ready, for in such an hour as you think not, the Son of Man comes. A few years ago, not too many years ago, it might have been longer, I think maybe five years ago, we came home and uh, our door was busted back open in the back there. Some man had come into our house and he kicked our back door open and my wife had went to the bathroom that's on this end of the house and, and she said, honey, there's water all over the floor. And uh, I, I said, well, Caleb's been here. Then I looked and I saw our door had been busted open. And I said, honey, come on. I didn't have anything with me that day. And, and I said, honey, let's just get on out of the house. And uh, we went out of the house and uh, uh, they came and found out that he went in that one bedroom and ransacked it. And, and then he went to, he got clothes out of my closet. I hope they were way too big for him. And he got clothes out of my closet. And, and uh it was raining real heavy and he took all of his old wet clothes off and threw them up under uh, our bed back there and, and then he went and got him and he didn't find nothing in that room and he went and got him a gallon of milk out of the refrigerator and took it back to our bedroom where all of my stuff is and, and that's when we came in the police said that when we came in when we walked out he was still there and uh, he, he went out and you see what let me tell you something if I knew he was coming, I'd have been locked and loaded, yeah, sitting there waiting on him. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? He would have never come into my house if I knew when he was coming. But the problem is, I didn't know when he was coming. I didn't know when he was coming. I wasn't ready for him to come. Let me tell you, you better be ready for the Lord to come. Amen. You better be ready for the Lord to come because he's coming. You don't know when, but you better be ready. I said you better be ready. You better be ready. Hallelujah. Let me, uh, you see, I, I, I'd have done that. I, I'd have been ready for that rascal. He'd have never gotten my house. You better be ready. But let me share with you, watching doesn't mean standing around twiddling their thumbs like we're waiting on a bus. Right. The Bible said in Acts chapter 1 and verse 10, while they looked steadfastly toward heaven as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, which had also said, You men of Galilee, why stand you here gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus. Hallelujah. This same Jesus, which was taken up from you into heaven, shall come in like manner as you see him go into heaven. You see, if we are truly watching, we're going to be truly working. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. If you really believe the Lord can come today, let me tell you this. If you really believe the Lord can, to, can come today, you're going to do everything possibly you can to get your family ready for the rapture of the church. My Lord, did you hear what I said? If you really believe the Lord can come today, we're going to be doing everything we can to get everybody we can right with the Lord Jesus Christ. 
if we really believe he's coming. Let me tell you this week, we don't believe he's coming if we hadn't talked to our family about the Lord this week. We don't really believe he's coming if we hadn't got out and told the world about the love and the mercy of Jesus. We just don't believe he's coming. But if we believe he's coming, we're going to be doing everything we can to get everybody we can into a right relationship with Jesus. Oh my goodness. Two or three songs came to my mind as I was studying this week. So as we look around us, we all see all the fields are white. Yes. They're ripening under the harvest, yet so quickly comes the night. Christians, you must get busy. Yes. Oh, there's so much work to do. Here's an urgent task awaiting you. Souls are crying. Men are dying. Won't you lead them to the cross? Go and find them. Oh, please help. Please help to win them. Win the lost at any cost. So if we truly believe the Lord's coming, watching will give us a passion to work. Amen. Oh my goodness. Not only that, but that leads me to the second incentive. If we truly believe the Lord could come today, we would be separating ourselves from this old world Amen. that we live in. Titus chapter 2 and verse 11. For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, that we should live soberly and righteously and godly in this present world, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and Savior Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify himself a peculiar people, zealous of good works. Here's one thing I know for certain. When the Lord returns, you better hope that he can distinguish you from the world. Did you hear what I said? When the Lord comes, you better hope that he can tell that if you're a part of the kingdom or part of the world. Amen. Did you hear what I said? You better know that. Amen. There used to be a day when you could tell the church from the world. Amen. There used to be a day when we had an identity. When we had a name. We used to be called names, you know. Yeah. We used to be called holy rollers. We even got called fanatics and everything else. But where's our name anymore? Where, where, where's the distinction we have? When the Lord comes, he's coming back after a bride that he can tell is his bride. Somebody help me a minute. He's going to know that they're his. If we really believe the Lord's coming back today, we're going to live like that. We're going to live like that. 2 Corinthians 6 and 17, Wherefore come out from among them. And be, you don't hear this much anymore. You just don't hear this much anymore. Come out from among them and be his separate, saith the Lord. And touch not the unclean thing. And I will receive you and will be a father to you. And you shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord God Almighty. Hallelujah. God help me to live right. If I really believe the Lord's coming, I'm going to separate myself from this old world. I'm not going to live like this world lives. My goodness. I'm not going to have the mindset of the world. The third incentive we must possess is an incentive of patience. James chapter 5 and verse 7, Be ye patient, be patient therefore, brethren, under the coming of the Lord, behold, the husbandman waiteth for the precious fruit of the earth, and hath long patience for it until he receive the early and latter rain. Amen. Be ye also patient, establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord draweth nigh. Verse 8, the application is clear. Just like the farmer, every believer should be patient and stand firm because the Lord 
is near. Be patient demands an attitude which shows long suffering in the presence of affliction and injustice. Believers should show their stamina without complaining and giving up and uh, being so defensive and retaliating. You know, uh, this world's in a mess. Amen. I don't have to tell nobody that. And we're going to, if you think you're going to get through this world without your problems and without your difficulties and without your sorrows and with, with all the troubles in this world, you shall have tribulation. If you think that you're not going to get through it without all of those things, you have just got, you're messed up. Because we're going to go through those things. Now we have a choice to make. Can we be all upset? Can, uh, do, do, do we choose to retaliate? Do we, do, do we refuse to be impatient? Do, do we latch out at one another? Do, do we, do we uh, uh, be mean-spirited? Somebody help me a minute. Do, do we choose to do those things? Or do we just say, now, now just wait a minute, I'm going to stop in my tracks and remember something. This is just for a little while. The Lord is about to come. Somebody help me just a minute. The Lord is about to make his appearing. I wish somebody would give him praise right there. The Lord. Oh my goodness. <laughs> Verse 8 urges us to show patience and courage because of the nearness of Jesus' return. Yes, we should show a firm purpose and depend constantly on God's grace. And we can find the strength. Hallelujah. Somebody say, I'm going to make it. Hallelujah. In other words, just hang on. Did you hear what I said? It's about to be over with. I don't know if that excites you or not, but just hang on. It's about to be over with. Amen. Let me say it again. Just hang on. It's about to be over with. Jesus is about to return. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And that's the only reason I can handle it. If in this world only you have hope, you are of all men most miserable but my hope is not in this world my hope is not in the white house my hope is not in my social security check when I get one my, my hope is not in some systems of this world my hope is in God himself that promise that he would take care of me those that endure to the end the same shall be saved hang on church Turn to your neighbor and say, just hang on. It's about over with. Hallelujah. Hang on. Hang on. Some of these days I'm going home. Where no sorrow ever owns. We'll soon be done with troubles and trials. Safe from heartaches, pain, and care, we shall all that glory share. Sit down beside my Jesus and sit down and rest a little while. Somebody pat your foot with me or something. Just hang on, it's going to be all right. Hallelujah. 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 Thank you, Lord. So, not only that, and we've got to be patient. But here's the big one. If you really believe that the Lord can come today, you're going to have the greatest desire of your life to be pure. Amen. That's right. Come on. 1 John chapter 3 and verse 2. Beloved, now we are the sons of God. It does not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when he shall appear... We shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And verse 3 is the kicker. And every man that hath this hope in him 
purifieth himself even as he is pure. I've heard some people say there ain't no even need of trying to be like that. You better be trying to be like that. You better be trying to be as pure as you can be. Because believers have hope and anticipate being with the Lord for eternity. They pursue a pure life. Amen. The goal of living a pure life is to be like Jesus. He is pure and we better be doing everything in our power to be just like him. My goodness. That lays the groundwork for the comments that, comments that John will make later in that chapter depicting sin as incomfortable in, in, in with fellowship in Christ and compatible. You see, purity is a strong theme in the New Testament. Amen. In Matthew chapter 5 and verse 8, Jesus taught, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Paul sought to present believers as a pure virgin to Christ in 2 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 2. Believers are to be pure and blameless for the day of Christ in Philippians chapter 1 and verse 10. 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 2 speaks of a, a pure conduct a believer should pursue, should pursue which stands out to the unbelievers. Let me tell you, if you act like the world, why do they want to come to church in the first place? If you're hateful and mean and judgmental and all those things that goes with it, and they see you and your conduct, why do you think they want to come to church? Might be why some of them get in their fishing boats on Sundays and go to the lake because they got people around them that don't live what they should live like. That's right. You got to be pure. You got to be pure. Somebody help me. Somebody help me. You got to be pure. To be pure is to be free from sin. To live increasingly like Christ in a world filled with evil. Now I'll stop there and say this. I know. I know I'd be lying to you. That if I tell you that you'll never sin, you will sin. Amen. You will sin. But you, that, that's why I believe it says you better purify yourself. Amen. You know what to do when the Holy Spirit speaks to you. And let you know that you've done something wrong. Amen. Or you've said something wrong. Or you've, or, 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 or you've just sinned. He'll let you know that. Uh, and the only way to purify yourself is not to blab it and to grab it and call somebody. Get on your face before God and say, I'm sorry for what I've done. Would you forgive me of that sin in my life? Amen. Repent. Amen. Amen. The church needs a lot of repentance. Amen. My goodness. Those who do that can look forward to heaven rather than fear the future of judgment. Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 25, Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, Amen. that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word, that he may present, might present to him himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle, or any such thing, but it that should be holy and without blemish. Let me ask you, have you worked toward that goal this week? Any bride desires to keep her dress spotless and not be all wrinkled up. And if we believe that our bridegroom is about to come, we should have a deep desire to keep our wedding clothes clean and unspotted. To me, I, I've never seen a bride that wasn't so concerned about the wedding dress. I just never seen one. That, maybe one. We had one one time that, up in Rogersville, Tennessee. That was a. I never understood why she wanted to go out and play football in a wedding dress, but she did. 
and she got mud all over her wedding dress. Never will forget that. But 99.9.9% of brides want to keep the wedding dress pure. They don't want anything on it. They, they spent a lot of money for it. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? They paid for it. They bought it. But especially it's because they want it to be pure and white when the groom walks through the door. They want to be the prettiest they have ever been in their life for when the groom walks through the door. You know one thing I love to do? I like to watch the bride, but I love to watch the groom too. Because when they walk in, when they walk in and see that bride standing there with that pure white dress that don't have wrinkles on it, there's a smile comes on their face like you've never seen. And a lot of times I've watched them in tears, big tears, have come down their cheeks because they see the bride and she's ready for him. She's ready for him. What a sight. Can I tell you, I know it's going to be exciting for us when the Lord comes. But I tell you what the most exciting day I believe of the Lord's life is when the Father leans over to Him. Yes. When the Father leans over to Him and says, Son, you left heaven, you went to earth. You did everything that you were supposed to do. You, uh, you lived among men. You went to an old rugged cross. They, they abused you. They beat you. They misused you. They did all of that. You died upon that old rugged cross. But you came back the third day after they put you in the tomb. Amen. You've been up here with me for a long time. You've been up here with me almost 2,000 years. Now, son, it's time. Go get your bride. <laughs> I don't know. I wish I could see heaven when the Lord tells him, man. Because finally, he's going to go get the bride that he died for. And can you imagine when he looks? That day, I'm telling you, he's going to look and he's going to find some. I, I hear people talking about the church all the time. Talk about it if you want to. God's going to have a church. Hallelujah. That's going to be without spot and without wrinkle. And he's going to step out, hallelujah, on the clouds of glory. Hallelujah. The dead in Christ are going to rise first. And then we which are alive and remain are going to be called up together with him in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. you got to be pure. Pastor, what kind of things makes me impure? Well, let me give you just a little list. You know, we think as church people that you have to murder or you have to do something to get drunk or smoke pot or do something like that to get your wedding dress wrinkled or spotted. But you know gossip. Don't be a gossiper when the Lord comes. Because you'll have spots and wrinkles on your wedding dress. Don't be a backbiter when the Lord comes because you'll have spots and wrinkles on your dress and you won't go. Did you hear what this preacher said? You won't go. Lying. Unfaithfulness. Make spots on a wedding dress. Becomes wrinkled when we fail to pray and read his word. You remember, here's what I believe the church needs to hear. We're not so much about committing sin as we are about omitting sin. Right. Or, or, or omitting the things of God. Because when we fail to pray and we fail to read God's word. Yes. And we omit the things that we know that it's going to take to get to heaven. Right. Guess what? That is just as much sin yeah, is. as committing a sin yeah, when we omit them. God help me to be pure. 
I have to work on that. Did you hear what I said? I have to work on that. Because every day, if I notice and I check myself, I can find something in my life that was not pure like he wanted it to be. It might have been a thought. It might have been a word that came out of my mouth. It might have been an opportunity I had to witness to somebody and I passed it up. But I can find places in my life that I'm not pure. I'm telling you, church, it's time. I was wondering about this message. I called Shirley yesterday morning. I guess it was yesterday morning sometime. And I said, Shirley, in our song selections tomorrow, could we sing some songs about that the Lord's about to come? And she said, Pastor Gann, you won't believe this. I said, you won't believe this, Pastor Gann. She said, but I was just watching on television this morning of them talking about the bride of Christ. Of talking about the bride of Christ. And she said, I felt in my heart that I needed to find songs about the Lord's return. I looked briefly this morning on Katie Brown's post. Does anybody know Katie Brown? You remember Katie? I looked on Katie Brown's post and she's got a little girl. She couldn't get the little girl to sleep last night, Brother Bill. She couldn't get a little girl to sleep because the little girl was standing, bouncing her in her bed saying, Jesus is coming. Jesus is coming. She just couldn't get her to sleep last night. She kept saying, Jesus is coming. Jesus is coming. You better be ready. You better be watching. Don't reject the Holy Spirit by not watching for Him and living today like you really believe the Lord could come today. Come on, Sister Shirley. Would you stand with me? Madeline, y'all come on. Would you stand with me this morning? (laughs) You know, I wished I had to Something, I don't know if I can figure out a way to do it or not. Somebody hit me a minute. Is anybody got a neat pen with it? I got one. Do you see this white piece of paper? Do you see how pure white that is? Let me show you something. That's pure white. I don't see anything on it. It's got the wrinkles. I can't help that right now. But do you know what? If I just put one little dot, can you tell me that's pure now? Pure white? Can you convince me that that's pure white? No, why? Because it's got that one little one little spot. He's coming after church without spot. You don't know him in the full pardon of your sins. And you think you're going to have next week or the next or the next day. You're not promised tomorrow. Today is the day of salvation. So if you're here this morning and you don't know him, you don't know Jesus, you know that you've got things in your life that you need to be forgiven for. I beg you, I plead with you, I ask you, I ask you to please consider giving your life to Jesus because the Lord can come today. Let me tell you what's going to happen. If you don't know, it's very simple. Those who are right with God are going to go in the rapture of the church. And those that are left behind I hear people say all the time, well, there's going to be people get saved in the tribulation. Well, there, 
there will be. But if you can't get saved while the Spirit draws you, you tell me you, 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 can, you can get saved while, while the Spirit's dealing with your heart. And you tell me that you're just going to wait to then when literally to be saved then, if I know the Scripture, you'll have to have your head cut off. You'll have to have your head cut off. Because if you don't deny, if you say, I, I, I believe in the Lord, if you say, if you have any, if there's anything within you to say that I believe in the Lord, the only way you're going to make it then is they'll cut your head off. <laughs> and people tell me that they're going to do that when they can't do it here. You better get saved now. You better get saved now. Amen. The rapture's fixing to take place. And you're going to be dealing with that soon. You're going to be dealing with that. If you're left behind, you're going to be dealing with that. Amen. I'm glad I'm out of here, aren't you? <laughs> I'm glad just any day now, just any moment now, I'm out of here. So please get yourself right with God. Does anybody need special prayer this morning? Does anybody need special prayer?